But if any of you ever want to get a chair to sit in for meditation, you have to get early these days. <laughs> the chairs go very quickly. But I would also say that you know, all of these talks are streamed live, so you could always manage to see this at home. But anyway, it's nice to see all of you settling down now. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, I never really know for sure what I'm going to talk about. But just uh, I came earlier today out because um, there was a visiting Bhutanese monk and I was saying hello to him before he leaves for uh, the eastern part of Australia. And just after talking with him for half an hour, as I went to just around the back here is the monks' quarters. It's just a little um, part of this complex with you know, three rooms for monks. And I was just sitting there with a cup of tea, just relaxing, just getting ready for this evening's um, talk and celebrations. And as I was relaxing there, I was just looking out in the windows, they rather the uh, the blinds were open, looking out into the little garden we have there. And as I was looking out into this garden, it was a simple garden, just a tiny bit of lawn and a few bushes. But it looked so beautiful. And I felt this wonderful sense that as a monk, as a human being, there is a lot of beauty available for us to notice in this world. And just sitting there, just perceiving the beauty of that little garden. I was a content little monk. So content I wasn't drinking my tea. <laughs> I was just looking at the little garden. Quiet, pretty still, and just enjoying. And that just gave me the subject for this talk this evening about how to perceive happiness in this world. You know, even in such simplicity. And there's actually a word for that. And the word for how to perceive happiness in this world, or well, one of the words, is called a you know, simple gratitude. I was grateful that there's a little garden I can just sit down and admire. Now, first of all, if ever you have a garden at home, or enjoy one of the gardens here, or in the park, or in King's Park, or wherever. You know, sometimes people don't know how to enjoy a garden. Sometimes you can sit there and think, the grass needs mowing. I'll organize someone to do that. There's lots of leaves just all over the place. They need raking. We've got to put some better bushes in there than those scraggly old bushes which we have in our monk's garden. And actually, we should, the trees actually, we should have some better trees in there. We could have put a little path over here. Or maybe, maybe this is a Buddhist temple so we can put a little Buddha statue on there somewhere. That's not enjoying a garden. That's trying to improve it or trying to sort of get rid of things which upset you. Instead of that, you appreciate the garden completely as it is. Okay, whenever I start these talks, all these old stories start coming up. I don't know, is there any people from Japan here today? J Japanese? Crikey. Anyway, Japanese are well known for their appreciation of gardens. In some of the Japanese gardens in monasteries become world-renowned. And there was one of these Japanese gardens, this old monk, who had one of the most beautiful gardens, not just in Japan, but for the whole world. And he would clean up and arrange the garden in the morning, and in the afternoon, he'd open it up for inspection. The public can go and visit. And it was such a gorgeous Zen garden that many times people would sit meditation there and get very, very deep meditation. It was like learning how to balance nature 
and how to create an atmosphere with the the uh, the rocks and the trees and the bushes and the flowers in such a way that it was just inspiring. And so anyway, there was this old meditation monk. Please always be careful of meditation monks. In the stories I tell, they always win out in the end. <laughs> and he wanted to find out the why this was the best garden in the whole world, some said. So he arrived early, he climbed over the fence and sneaked in and hid behind a bush to see the secret of the most beautiful Japanese Zen garden in the world. And after he was hiding for a few moments, the monk came out, the gardening monk. And the gardening monk came out with two big baskets. And he went into the middle of the garden, there was a big plum tree, a very beautiful plum tree, and a bit of a lawn around. He went to collect the leaves, which had fallen the night before. He wouldn't just rake them up, he'd actually pick them up by hand. He'd have a look at them. And if he thought they could be used, they were beautiful enough, he put them in one basket. If he thought they were like unusable, like rubbish leaves, he put them in the waste basket. And he sifted leaf by leaf in the garden and collected all the leaves. And of course he had that beautiful artistic eye. He could know by their color and by their shape which leaves would be possible to include in his masterpiece of a garden. And then he threw all the rubbish leaves in the compost pile. And then he paused, he had a cup of tea, meditated for a few minutes, and then went out into the garden to make the most important part of his work of art. He took each leaf from the good basket and put them on the lawn around the, the plum tree exactly in the right place. You could tell the colors of the leaves, whether they're still green or sort of going yellow or gold, like some leaves do. And he had this wonderful sense of the interaction of color and shape. So once he'd actually finished putting each leaf down one by one, sometimes he would stop and say, no, that's not quite right. And he just turned it a little bit. And it would change just the whole perception there of something really gorgeous. And so after a, a couple of hours of putting each leaf down in that garden, he stopped and the garden looked absolutely amazing. He had that gift. Sometimes I've seen people do that. I can't. Uh, I have a little bit of artistic um, temperament. I did get a couple of paintings in an exhibition when I was a kid. But anyway, that was a long time ago. But this guy was just a genius. Have you ever seen those people who have just that gift? They paint something or put something down and it's just amazing. Anyway, when he was finished, that was when the old meditation monk came out of hiding. And the gardening monk hadn't seen him. And the meditation monk came and said, I've just been watching you all morning. And I'm so impressed. You know, your effort, your care for detail, and the way that your sense of color, shape, and the relationship between all these different parts of the garden is really incredible. And he said, your garden is almost perfect. I don't know if you listened to what I just said the words of that meditation monk, your garden is almost perfect. And that was just like a shiver of shock went right through the gardening monk's body. And the gardening monk fell on the floor, he put his hands up as Buddhists do and said, Venerable Ajahn, Venerable Teacher, you've been sent here by some uh, bodhisattva gods to come and let me know how to make my garden really perfect. Thank you so much for coming here. Please instruct me. 
And the old monk said, you really want to know? Yes, please don't hold back your compassion. Teach me, O oh great master. Okay, said the old meditation monk. What the meditation monk did, he put his arms around the tree in the middle of the garden. Even though he was old, he was still quite strong. He put his arms around the tree and shook the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and twigs and leaves went all over the place. <laughs> and if that gardening monk was shocked before, he was terrified now. What have you done? My whole morning's work. But the meditation monk said, ah, oh, now that's perfect. <laughs> and I remember that story. It's in one of those books which I wrote. And I thought how wonderful that story is. To see <laughs> that leaves all over the place. There's some perfection in that. Why do you have to fix it up and make it more beautiful? Isn't it good enough? I remembered that story when I was looking at the tiny bit of garden we have outside our monk's quarters. Instead of wanting it to be different, improving it, I appreciated it for wh what was there. I was grateful for having a garden to look at. Not the best, not the worst, but I could start seeing its beauty. So that's the same with our government. <laughs> Am I shocked you now? <laughs> Sometimes we think, oh, can't they be any better? Is this a better look? Can you be better? You elected them. <laughs> so a lot, of a lot of times, instead of seeing what's wrong with our government, can't we see what's right with them? and have gratitude. Weird, but a few times, oh, what is it? There was one monk, and you know, he went in for a simple procedure in one of the hospitals. This was many years ago. And when he came back, he said, oh, I'm feeling so much better now. And I said, well, why don't you thank somebody? Who, he said. Go and write a letter to the Minister of Health saying thank you for the hospital and the doctors who treated me. He said, that's a crazy idea, Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, I'm full of crazy ideas. <laughs> but he wrote to the Minister of Health and got a personal letter back from the Minister of Health. We're I mean, not sort of by any secretary, but actually the Minister of Health at that time, saying, it's so rare to uh, receive a letter of thanks from one of the members of the community here in Australia. It's really appreciated, thank you. <laughs> I thought that was really weird. I never expected to get a letter back, but he did. So a lot of times, it's one of the things which I know, if you tell a person that you appreciate them, you're grateful for them, what do they do? What do you do if someone thanks you for who you are? Not for what you're not. They don't point out all your mistakes, you know those enough. They point out all the beautiful things in you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being this Buddhist society. You know, even though it's sometimes not enough seats, sometimes it's too hot, sometimes too cold, sometimes, you sometimes think, how could you improve this place? For example, instead of having this, this old carpet has been here for, I think it's been here as long as I, we've had this hall. I think it's pretty true. Dennis, you've been here, have you ever changed this carpet? <laughs> it's original, <laughs> it's heritage listed. <laughs> Can we have something softer? <laughs> Anyhow, for me it's good enough and it's wonderful to actually have a carpet to sit on. So instead of thinking what we can do to improve it, instead we have this beautiful gratefulness, what we've had. And we express it. We don't just know it, we express it. It's just the same that somebody asked me today, 
Can you talk about, you know, sometimes in a relationship, sometimes people get into the habit of being negative towards one another and saying bad things towards one another. I've seen that so often. Why do you do that? Instead of saying bad things towards one another, say a beautiful thing. Say, no, thank you for being my husband. Thank you for being my wife. We've been together for such a long time. One whole week. <laughs> but when you start to say nice things towards one another, what would happen to you if your partner said something nice to you? Would you actually think, oh, they've been listening to Raja Brahm too much? <laughs> they must be crazy. Or what do they want? Husband, you're so wonderful. Husband, you just work so hard. Husband, you're so caring. Can I have? <laughs> <laughs> no. Instead of that, you just say, it just because it's nice to say good things to people. Sometimes people think I'm a bit crazy. Because, you know, often to the monks, I mean, uh, you've only been, you know, uh, how long have you been in an office now? Three months. Three months. Have I ever criticized you? <laughs> no, he's a very good novice. And a lot of times, you know, I, I, I obviously I really try to praise people as much as I possibly can. Because when you actually appreciate people, so gratitude, a person. You know, I've got to stay with him for another two days yet. Here, yeah. so <laughs> if I pray, <laughs> if I praise him and say nice things to him, he will treat me even better. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know that. So the whole whole idea of criticizing and just you know not having that sense of gratitude to the people you live with. Sometimes I let that go a long time ago, as best I possibly could. Even sometimes people may have treated you harshly. As I said last week, you give that forgiveness, and instead you start to appreciate the people you live with. And I say that you know, when I used to go and teach in prisons, I'm not teaching in prisons now, even though this evening, Friday night, one of the monks would be in Carnet Prison Farm this evening, teaching at this time. I think they're still there at this time. Very well received, simply because there's few people actually go inside prisons and tell some of these people what good people they are, what kind of people they are. And that's something which is very rare for someone in jail to hear. So you can imagine what that does to people. I'll tell you what it does to people. There was one of the, these stories of when I was teaching over in Carnet Prison Farm. One of the prisoners who was there for drug dealing, one time when I was just going in, he grabbed me by the shoulder, you know, kindly, he wasn't trying to, to hurt me, and pulled me to the, the schoolroom. So come and have a look at this, Sajjan Brahm. And on the schoolroom were all these cards written by, I think, grade sixes or grade, yeah, grade sixes, grade sevens in the local primary school, you know, which was, I don't mind saying it now because it's a long time ago, I won't get in anyone in trouble, in Jaradel Primary School. Because what the head teacher of Jaradel Primary School had done was something, if I saw who she was, sadhu, 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 well done. The government was trying to get the schools to teach the kids about the dangers of drugs. And what most schools would do, maybe invite the police or invite some psychologist or you know, some doctor or something, to scare the kids. But what this <laughs> teacher did, she invited two of the prisoners in jail to come and teach the kids what happens when you take drugs. 
And these two, two um, people they invited were my students in jail. And they'd gone in there the whole day teaching kids, you know, year, grade sixes and grade sevens or whatever, what it really is like when you take drugs and you deal drugs and get into trouble for drugs. Just the amount of suffering that creates for you in your social life and everything else. And anyway, these cards just show the effects of that one day they spent in, in this school. I went back again that evening, back into jail. But that day they were out, the kids just wrote all these beautiful cards. Nick, when you get out, please come and visit us again. Please may get released soon. That was amazing what you taught us. We love you, Nick. I forget who the other guy was. Nick was one of these guys. He was a guy who actually just grabbed me by the shoulder to take me to see this. And you wouldn't believe just how much tears were rolling out of his eyes. It was streaming down his face. The amount of joy and happiness that had given him. He'd actually done something. He's done something to repay, you know, the, the guilt he felt. Well, I did see Nick many years later at the airport. <laughs> So waiting for somebody to arrive and I felt a hand on my shoulder again and he said hi Ajahn Brahm and he was dressed in a really nice suit he had a proper job and he said I'm still meditating I'm still meditating <laughs> he kept on saying and it's wonderful actually to see just how someone could have that little bit of trust and see something good in someone who'd done a very terrible crime and then had actually invited them to show that goodness to little kids, show his humanity. And he appreciated that so much, having that opportunity to do something really worthwhile. Who knows best about what happens than someone who's done it and got into big trouble for it? Much more than any sort of professor. But anyhow, this is actually, and they're human beings just like each one of you as human beings. So when people criticize you or tell you bad things, that is one reason I've said this before, you have two ears. One to go in, one to go out, if you don't like it. So if you're talking to your partner and they're saying something nice, please put <laughs> one hand over your ear <laughs> and keep what they say. And the other thing is always to make sure you tell your partner what you really appreciate. What you really appreciate is any words of kindness, any acts of kindness. Isn't that what you appreciate? All the stuff which we do here, we may be able to give a talk later on, uh, arranging a lion dance. Eddie Koo is, always does that every year, he just goes through such a lot of trouble to make that happen. And so Eddie, are you in the back there somewhere? I think maybe outside waiting for the, the lion dance to come. But anyway, thank you, Eddie. It is much appreciated. In the same way that even though sometimes we get some neighbors coming in, say, you're making too much noise. Because you know what, it's gonna be loud, because that's what the lion dance is. It's supposed to scare bad spirits away. But for me, I don't think that scares bad spirits away. Please, bad spirits, come here and we'll just convert you. <laughs> and you'll become good spirits again. <laughs> that, was <laughs> that was that sign. I th we still have it somewhere uh, in, <laughs> in Jhana Grove. Started off when we first got Bodhinyana Monastery over 40, I don't know, about 40 years ago. And then, you know, it was people would actually come in and steal things in the first year. Cause there was no fence there, no gate or anything. And so, you know, we had to put a sign up. And I was a builder there. So I was asked to put a sign up. Trespassers would be prosecuted. I think that's not nice, prosecuting people. So, you know what I said? I put in a sign trespassers will be converted <laughs> to Buddhist monastery. <laughs> and you know, that really kept trespassers out. 
They didn't mind being prosecuted but being converted and all. That's a bit too much. <laughs> but a bit of sense of humour and a bit of kindness, it does go such a long way. And that's one of the reasons why that a bit of kindness to the people you have to live with. Why not? Why not say, I'm sorry I said that? Or Otherwise people get into these bad habits. One thing I have noticed that whenever there is any bad speech, people don't realize they're doing it. I remember just this artist I remember knowing over in Rolling Stone. He used to say that when he was teaching in art school, that one of his friends was so angry at him one day, he punched him. And then he saw this uh, so-called enemy a couple of years later, and the enemy sort of gave him a big hug and said, oh, we were such great friends when we were teachers together. <laughs> he'd totally forgotten he'd actually punched this other guy. And so sometimes it's amazing just our perception of what happened and other people's perceptions of what happened are sometimes totally different. It's hard to change other people's perceptions, although I do that every Friday with you guys. <laughs> but nevertheless, to change your own perceptions, have more happiness in life. Would you like to be happy? Do you need to win the lottery to be happy? Do you need to pass your exams to be happy? I don't know if he's still here, but this one kid earlier, this one kid, many, I've, I've seen many kids like this in my life. You know, just finished the year 12 and worrying whether he would get a place of being a doctor or not in, in the hospital. You know, honestly, it doesn't matter. I've seen so many kids here when it gets to the end of year 12s and they get their exams. So many kids, like I've known them for a long time, crying their eyes out because they didn't pass, at least not as well as they expected. And I see them many years later and they're just wonderful people, having a wonderful life. This one girl, I mean she was just, <laughs> I thought she was just depressed and going to kill herself or something. But then she got a nice job and then the things which she really liked doing, she had different abilities in her life. And now she's married with a nice kid. She's up in Geraldton or somewhere. A wonderful woman. And I've seen that too often. Just please stop judging. The garden, put your hands around the tree and shake the hell out of it. It doesn't look what you thought was a beautiful garden, but it becomes even more beautiful than you never expected. This is where we change that critical mind with an appreciative, grateful mind. There's so many people I've seen, they, sometimes they come here, it's actually not really that true these days, sometimes in the old days, people who had problems will come to the temple. And those people who are successful, what do you need to come to the temple for? I'm already successful. <laughs> and that's why sometimes that people told me that in Thailand, in those monasteries there, that if you were a woman, in the village, you would never go to the temple alone because they would think you're having trouble with your husband. <laughs> that was totally untrue. But people just wanted to go there, just have a bit of peace and quiet. What a wonderful thing peace and quiet is. And so sometimes the criticism of others, even if they do criticize you, how much can you trust that? What other people say, if it's criticism, or bad speech, they just don't know a thing about what life is or what relationships are. You don't shout at people, you're kind to them. And kindness always in life gets you much further. We're getting to the time now of our AGM is coming up soon and we're still looking for people to actually to take on some important positions in our committee. And there was this one woman years ago, you know, she was a very successful woman, and I asked her, 
know, can you please um, come and be our president next year? And she said, quite honestly, I can't. I'm so busy, you know, my business is going well, I'm employing many people, I'm successful, I'm just too busy to come and join as your president. And she was being honest, I know she was a very tough lady. And so of course, you had to use Buddhist psychology. <laughs> Poor lady. <laughs> The psychology, it's pretty obvious. I told her afterwards, actually, no, I think you're right, you are too busy. I'm sorry I asked you, I shouldn't have done that, please forgive me for asking you. You know, you, you do too much work with your business and your family, and so, please, I never said, I never invited you, and even if you do decide to nominate, I won't allow that. <laughs> <laughs> and I left it like that. And of course, when she went home, what does he mean, I can't be president? What's wrong with me? <laughs> and she nominated. That was Rachel. <laughs> and she always admits that I jump right. So be very careful. If I come up and say to you, you're not allowed to be the secretary, be careful. We don't, I don't know what nationality are you. We don't allow Bangladeshi people to be secretaries. <laughs> <They were. laughs> no, because I've told that story, it doesn't work. <laughs> but nevertheless, sometimes the kind speech and the gratitude you have, just saying thank you for all the service which you've done, it's amazing. How does it feel to be thanked, to be praised? I must admit, one of the times when I got praise, probably one of the, the most moving praises which I ever got in my whole life, probably, was, I think I've mentioned to you that when I was at university, working hard at a very full social life, and Buddhist society life, and all sorts of lives, but a couple of my friends, I was a Buddhist, I told people I was a Buddhist, they knew I was a Buddhist, but a couple of my friends were Christians and they said that they were volunteering once an afternoon to go and do social service. It was at Fullborn Hospital, it was a place where, like a mental hospital, like a Greylands. But it wasn't just for people having suffering stress or uh, mental disorders. It's also that they had a unit there for people who had Down syndrome. I always remember that. In those days, anyone who was not the same as everybody else was actually just isolated. And so anyway, I didn't know what was going on, but because my friends, they were Christians, they were volunteering. I thought, I'm a Buddhist. I've got no time to volunteer, but ugh, I'm not going to be outdone by my friends. <laughs> It was total spiritual pride. If they're going to do it, I'd have to do it as well. So, so every, I think every Thursday afternoon when I was up at university, I spent an afternoon, and in the end I started rearranging my schedule with you know, um, the tutorials and stuff to make sure that Thursday afternoons were free. So I could go to this hospital on the bus the Christians only lasted a couple of weeks. I went for two years. They all said that I was the most <laughs> long-serving sort of student ever come to that place to, to actually look after these Down syndrome people. And of course I did that because I loved it. I learned much more giving. Actually I never gave, I just got so much back. But anyway, to get to the point that after two years, I was so well trusted that in that afternoon there was two groups. I looked after one group all by myself in the first part, and then we stopped for tea. It was England, we always stopped for tea. And then the other group in the second part of the afternoon. And I had no idea what they were doing. 
these were Down syndrome kids, they really knew how to keep a secret. And then after the second session was finished, I was invited in to both groups together. They wanted to say thank you to me. And they arranged all these cards. You know, thank you for coming for two years. And that meant so much to me. I think I cried. And afterwards, <laughs> I had to say, um, why do you think I'm leaving today? I said, well, you, your exams are starting next week. I said, no, they're not. Another six or seven days yet. No, another eight days. I'm still free next week. Can I please go? Because <laughs> I enjoyed going there. But the fact you got thank, uh, thanks and sincere thanks from people who I thought when I first went there were lesser human beings, but were not lesser at all. You appreciated them, got to know them, and got to value them, and be so grateful for their friendship for those years. Uh, seriously. And that gratitude which I learned there is what you also like to practice with each one of you. Be grateful that you're a friend, grateful that you come here, grateful that you listen, and grateful that um, you make a better world. Sometimes, as a monk, sometimes something which you know, I always get frustrated at, so only sometimes, because I, when I do get frustrated it means I'm not really understanding it properly. Sometimes as a monk, because we don't have any, as a monk we don't have money. Personally, all these years I've been working here <laughs> in the BSWA, I don't have any bank accounts, I don't have any superannuation, I don't have any money stashed away anywhere. I am actually totally penniless, honestly. And sometimes you see somebody, you want to help them. You know, I, I would love to give too, but sometimes you just can't. And sometimes, you know, you see somebody who outside, who just asks, you know, can you give me some money? I remember doing that when I went to India on pilgrimage. And then in Benares, the group who was running the pilgrimage did us a, a boat trip down the Ganges River. And when it landed, we were walking back to a bus to take us back to nice hotel, all paid for, and all these very poor people. It was quite a few years ago, and some of these people had leprosy. And this one Indian guy came running up to me and asked for some money. And he felt very, very frustrated I never had anything to give him at all, because I'm being a monk. So what I did, I just put my arm around him and gave him a nice big hug. That's all I could do. And uh, I always remember the smile he gave me back. A beautiful smile. And a smile that he appreciated that moment of just being hugged by a monk. And afterwards, I remember just coming back to Australia and just did a little bit of research the suicide rate in Australia per person was much higher than the suicide rate in India. Even amongst people who were living in such desperate situations, and being sick, being homeless, very little to eat. And you realize why? Even though he was sick, even though he had very little money, still he knew how to appreciate a simple thing like a hug. Someone cared for him. And that's the best I could do. This is the sort of things where we can learn what gratitude is. Saying thank you for a little garden where I can just sit and just enjoy 15 minutes of peace. Not maybe the most uh, beautiful garden, but more than good enough to relax, rest, and share whatever I felt with every one of you. There's much beauty here in Australia. There's much beauty in the world, believe it or not. There's much beauty in the government. I don't know why you laugh. 
Have you ever known anybody in the government? Sometimes they get very frustrated. Some of you know this story, that years ago, that I used to go and visit Sri Lanka, and some of the, my talks were quite well known. And so some of the people over there, they, they knew um, the president of Sri Lanka at the time. That was Rajapaksa. So he invited me to his palace for breakfast. And number one, I was impressed that whoever these governments are, they really know how to do their research. What do you get a monk for breakfast in Sri Lanka? Correct, you've heard the story. <laughs> I don't know where he got the baked beans from. It wasn't a national dish in Sri Lanka. And he served me himself with baked beans. But the one thing which I really know, remember, was when he came in, he, you know, he was just obviously just came out of bed. Because you know, he just has to stay up late at night. He was rubbing in his eyes. And as soon as he saw me, it was like a moment of honesty. He knew I wasn't a politician. And he told me, he said, Ajahn Brahm, I'm a failure. And that's the first time I've ever seen or heard a politician admitting that. And it quite shocked me. And he'd said the reason he felt a failure, this was a long time ago, when he was at the heights of his um, popularity. He said that he became a politician to try and find a peaceful way to settle the conflicts in that uh, country at the time with the Tamil Tigers. And he said that he couldn't find that solution. And so he was starting to decide on a military solution. And he said, I'm a failure. You can see that no, literally that moment he was opening up and feeling the pain of having to be a leader and take responsibility for a decision he didn't really approve of inside. I don't know how many other politicians will feel like that. It's a terrible, difficult position to be in. Please don't be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I thought, why? Why don't we do something innovative? In like difficult situations, states, you know, where they can't find a good leader, why does, say, the president, I'll get into trouble, I'm going to Sri Lanka soon. <laughs> why do we have to have a president of Sri Lanka who's Sri Lankan? If you get a president of a company, they don't have to be sort of, you know, like Seychelles or something, that was a British, um, the Dutch come, they don't have to be British or Dutch, they get the best person for the job. Why don't we get Obama? He's not doing anything. <laughs> be the president of Sri Lanka. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Instead of the president of Sri Lanka, why not the president of, or the prime minister of, of um, Australia? Anyway, that was just thinking outside the box. <laughs> But nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, um, I can see in the back there to be grateful to dear old Eddie and Bill, who comes every week and cleans up and has opened the doors for the monsters to come in. <laughs> so I'll, I'll finish off there because we have the lion dance coming in. There's not really much time for questions, but I'm always grateful that the different communities who come to our Buddhist center and this evening for the Chinese community can also enjoy a traditional lion dance here. Eddie usually gets the very best. So can I have people moving to the side? We have a couple of questions. I'll try and answer the questions quickly. Today they came earlier than we thought, but they can come in. I'll just do a couple of questions. From Bulgaria, are dreams a product of the mind or the brain? Thank you, Ajahn. 
both together. Oops. <laughs> oh, got 10 minutes before they're going to really come in. Are they getting dressed now? Okay, please make sure they're well fed first of all. We don't want them eating any other people here. Okay, they're just going to feed the lions for a few minutes. So for those interested, I will answer a couple of questions before the lions come in. Dreams a product of the mind or of the brain? Thank you, Ajahn. How many of you know the story, put your hand up if you know the story, of the man who dreamt of the five angels? I've only got two hands up, okay. This will show you whether a dream is a product of the mind or the brain. This guy over in Perth had this dream that five angels lined up and offered him five pots of gold. No, that's right. One pot of gold each worth a fortune and then when the no so five five pots of gold each so 25 pots of gold and when the last pot of gold was received that was when the guy woke up it was the morning he was in his bedroom he looked around his bedroom there were no angels he didn't mind that but there's no pots of gold either just a dream but when he went down for breakfast, his wife had already gone to work and found that his wife had made him five pieces of toast, five boiled eggs for breakfast. And he looked at the morning newspaper, it was the 5th of May, the fifth day of the fifth month. And he thought, what's with this magic number five? So he looked in the newspaper, and there was a horse racing course here called Ascot. A S C O T, five letters. And you can imagine what he thought when he opened the race that day. The fifth race, the fifth horse, was called Five Angels. <laughs> it's not that often that you get one of these omens. So he decided that you only get this maybe once in your life. He took afternoon off work. He went to the bank at lunchtime to keep the lucky number five. He took $5,000 out of his bank account. You only get this chance once. And so he went to the, the racetrack, chose the fifth bookmaker in line, and put $5,000 to win, horse number five, race number five, five angels. The lucky number five could not be wrong. The lucky number five wasn't wrong. His horse came in fifth. Okay, I thought you'd heard that one before. Now that's a kind of joke, but a real story. There was one of our members, used to come here, he's got a bit old now. He's over in, uh, over in Kelmscott, Rolling Stone. His wife was Singaporean. So every year she'd go back to visit her family. He had to go with her, he was married to her. And so one day, his brothers-in-law said, let's go to the racetrack. But before they went to the racetrack, they had to go to a lucky Buddhist temple. So they went to the lucky Buddhist temple. It was filthy. So they all worked really hard to clean it up. And once they finished cleaning it up, they thought, this is good karma. This must be work. And so then, just be two minutes. Okay. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> Once we cleaned it up, it must be lucky. They went to the racetrack and they all lost. 
But that night, he said, he had a dream. His dream was of a, of a racehorse winning. He remembered its name when he woke up. He looked in the newspaper, the Straits Times. That horse was running that day. And so he rang up all of his brothers-in-law and said, look, I dreamt of a horse, it's running that day. And because they were Singaporeans and he was a Westerner, he's actually from, from Cornwall, they didn't believe him. Look, no Singapore spirit will tell an, what they call an Angmo, <laughs> a Westerner, the name of a winning horse and not tell us. So they refused to go to the racetrack. He went there alone, put a lot of money on that horse and it won. And that made him really angry. <laughs> so sometimes, who knows? Anyway, here we have our, <laughs> our lion dance about to begin. So those red packets are for food. That's what Chinese lions eat. But you've got to put some cash in it or something. Otherwise, eat your hand. Sorry? A bonus, uh, very good. This place is extra good karma for you. <laughs> All you lions, you're going to live a nice peaceful life. Now you come here. So are they ready to begin? Okay, here come the lions. Be careful. They're bowing first of all. They're very respectful.
Hello, everybody. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Oh. Yeah, no, hello here. Can, can now, uh, yeah. The lion dance performers, they are from the Chunghua Association. A special thanks to them and to their leaders, Aaron Lung and Ben Lim. A big applause again for them. The place is clean already. Very good. <laughs> so, this is very special um, lion something. Oh. So, please take <laughs> some lion home something. with you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and, and thank you, Eddie, for arranging that every time. <laughs> and thank you again for the Changhua Association. So there's no way I can follow that. So, <laughs> except with just uh, paying respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, and then we can end the formal part of the ceremony. But please take some back with you, <laughs> some of the red gold, and then we won't get into trouble with the people who have to clean this place up afterwards. Okay, dokey. Arahang Sama Sambodo Bhagawa Budang Bhagawan Tang Abhiwademi Suakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagawato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Excellent. It's gone very quiet quickly. <laughs> okay. So again, thank you all for coming. And if you do have any questions you need to ask, you can always come up in front of us. <laughs>